Hello, good afternoon. Today, our guest is Pedro Gonzalez. Hello, Pedro. How are you doing? Hello, I'm well. How are you? I'm great, Pedro. So, Pedro, you are now inviting controversy in the right on the right wing. Is that so? Uh, that that is what people tell me. Yes. <laughs> well, I read their articles, Pedro, all the time. They're excellent, like most people who write for Chronicles. And I must say, Pedro, that if one argues that you are a barrio Nazi, that's a bit racist because it's like saying people of your descent only eat barrios. <laughs> yeah, that's well, a bar, bar, a barrio is it's like a ghetto. It's yeah. it's like the span, yeah. it's the Spanish word for ghetto. Yeah, I think. Uh, although I do love burritos. Um, but in Ohio, it's hard to find a good burrito. I think the the that whole thing with Ben Dominic from the he, he's no longer with the Federalist, by the way. I, what I, no, what I, happened? I don't know. I, I I don't think it's related at all to him calling me a barrio Nazi. It's not related at all. But the timing was just funny because, you know, he calls me a barrio Nazi, and then shortly after that, he announces that he's leaving the Federalist, and it's under. I think Molly Hemingway is going to run it now, and. He's at Fox News. I think he has his own show. I've, I've never seen it before, but um, but it's just it's interesting because I had actually I've actually met Ben. I met him once when I went to D.C. for three days as part of the Conservative Partnership Institute Fellowship, and he was a speaker at a dinner. And he actually he saw me and he he said at the time I was working for American Greatness, and he said to me. I fucking love American greatness. He's like, you guys do great work. And I was, oh, thanks, Ben. You know, and, and then it was really friendly. And then that was the one and only time we spoke. And then he just over time changed, secretly changed his view of me, I guess. And he started like that wasn't the first time. The Baro Nazi thing was like the second or third time that he's he's struck at me, but I had never responded because I thought it was just bizarre that someone who had been cordial with me now thought I was evil or something. And um, I did respond to the bio-Nazi thing just because I thought it was so funny and so absurd that I apparently live rent-free in Ben's head. And after he has a few drinks, he'll like lash out at me on the internet. So, uh, but it, it backfired. I mean, it made him look like a clown because it was just so absurd. Well, Pedro, I have never met Ben, but I, I have written a few articles for the Federalist, and at one point, Ben wanted to in, wanted me as a guest on his show, but for whatever reason, that agenda did not materialize. And when Ben Dominic was still at the Federalist, if I sent a, an email, he would have responded. So I don't have anything against him. No, no, I, I don't either. I... I, I don't resent the guy at all. I, I, I just think it's kind of amusing because, um, again, I have no idea what changed his opinion of me because it, he never communicated with me apart from that one time that we met in D.C. And the Federalist published me after that. And, I, you know, the Federalist does good work. Molly Hemingway does good work. I, I like the publication. They recently had a redesign. It actually looks really, really nice. It's, right now, it's probably one of the best aesthetically looking conservative websites and, and they do good work. That's why that's why I actually never responded to Ben when he would like attack me because I, it was kind of awkward, you know? Like I, I have a pretty good relationship um, with the, some of the people there just through friendly interactions on Twitter. And so it was just very strange that the publisher would occasionally lash out at me and call me like a psychopath or something. But um, I don't have any bad feelings towards towards Ben. I, I, again, I just... Uh, I think I even said, like, the guy's probably been drinking. Um, and that's probably why he thought it would be smart to call me a borrow Nazi. And then he he tried to, like, kind of play along and take credit for my new nickname. And so, yeah, I mean, I, again, I don't uh, I don't resent the guy. I just thought I, that whole thing was funny. I think that the Federalist had an astute editorial department. I know this because, as I said, I've written for the Federalist before. But... The downside of the Federalist is that it has the potential to be a really compelling magazine on the right, but because of fear, it cannot go too far. I think that this is the problem with the Federalist. Yeah, I, I have no idea. I actually don't. I don't. I don't read them a whole lot. I, I mostly just read Molly's work. But I, I think they, 
everyone has their kind of editorial boundaries. And yes, the yes. American greatness will go further in some directions than the Federalist Chronicles will go further in some directions than American greatness. Everyone kind of has a role to play. My rule in this whole scheme is just don't attack people to your right. And if you don't like something that someone to your right is saying, um, you don't have to say any, like, just, just don't comment on it, you know? Ignore um, them. I have yeah, mastered the them. art of ignoring people. It's not difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if, if, if someone is saying something really stupid, that's just like, it, it's actually harmful to the right as a movement, then their comments will usually help blow, like it, people often self-destruct, you know what I'm saying? And so you don't actually have to comment on things. If something is just egregiously dumb or whatever, um, if someone's just trying to be controversial for the sake of being controversial, which is kind of productive, their comments will usually discredit them. And so, you, so in other words, you don't have to say anything. I don't know how to say this, Pedro, but for years I have been ignoring the mainstream media. So every now and then I will look at the New York Times just to keep up to date with current events. But for the longest while, I have not been reading mainstream publications. When I want real information, I go to the Chronicles or I read academic journals. To be, to be honest, I learn about mainstream publications when I read Paul and he's mocking the writers. But beyond <laughs> that, I don't listen to mainstream people. Yeah, yeah they, they don't have much to offer. Most of them don't. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I, I, I admit that I occasionally read the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Business Insider because they will sometimes do good reporting and you can basically write articles that will read between the lines of their reporting. Um, but in, in the only, the, the other aspect, and this is, I think this is interesting uh, when you frame it like this, so much of conservative media, I would say that this is starting to change, but so much of conservative media will cover for the misdeeds and failures of the Republican Party. And so in a weird way, if you want to know what the Republican Party is up to and how they're grifting and lying to their base, uh, you can actually turn to like the business insider because obviously they don't they don't care about protecting the GOP's reputation or protecting a particular Republican. They're, they want to undermine them, but so do I, but I want to undermine them from the right. And so in a weird way, um, you can actually, you can actually advance the cause of the right by looking at the reporting of some of these other places, and then obviously just reframing it into, in, into a narrative that is helpful to what, to what you want to do. Um, but that's starting to change. I, you're starting to see more and more traditional conservative, you could even say mainstream media, start reporting adversarially against the GOP. Not, not nearly as much as they should, but it's certainly happening. And another vexing issue is that conservatives need to know when to comment and when to oppose. So I, didn't I did not read a story, but there's a, a story online about Stacey Abrams not wearing a mask and the conservatives are criticizing her. I have read studies disputing the efficacy of wearing masks, but the point of the story is that the optics of a situation will always be important. So even though Democrats are hypocritical, if I am listening to a Democratic politician on TV, I don't want to see that person wearing a mask. Bad optics. So Republicans should know when to speak. Yeah, I think, excuse me, I think with that, the, the whole thing, it's about hypocrisy, right? Or double standard, you know, Stacey Abrams makes all these kids wear a mask, but she doesn't have to wear one. That just shows Democrats are hypocrites. It's like, yeah, we all know. We all know that they don't follow their own rules, but it's, in a sense, it's not a double standard. It, it's a kind of hierarchy. Like they're just reminding you that they're more important than you are. And pointing that out doesn't actually do anything. There, there are very few people who are not already convinced that they agree with you, that when you show that to them, they'll say, oh, you're right, Democrats are hypocrites. I'm, I'm going to start voting Republican or something. It just, it, it's more of just for, for bomb throwing, except the bomb is actually not that effective. And it, it, it's really just for, it, it's cheap, uh, I guess, like a it's cheap like gimmick. clicks. 
yeah, it's a gimmick. Cheap clicks, traffic, you know, look at how dumb Stacey Abrams is. But, but I mean, I don't do it because I think it's it's ultimately inane and it, it doesn't really do anything. Uh, like, yeah, Stacey Abrams is repulsive uh, and, and she's a terrible person. Uh, and, and what she's doing and what Democrats are doing is just reminding you of, of how little they think of you. So what are you going to do about it? Are you going to tweet or are you going to, you know, find ways to to seriously undermine them and, and get them out of power? Mm. The silliness of people on the right. But we're going to get into the meat of the matter by discussing your article, starting with this article. Don't like Twitter. New, don't like Twitter's new CEO. Blame Paul Singer. Give us a lecture. Tell us about the article and tell us about Paul Singer and speak for as long as you would like. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to do this. It's, been, it's actually been a while since I've, uh, I've published that. So I'm, I'm going to let's see how good my memory is, if I can recite the entire article from memory. No, the, the gist of it is that that over the last, let's say, a little, I think a little over a year, actually, um, Paul Singer's hedge fund, Elliott Management. And if you don't know who Paul Singer is, he's a GOP mega donor. He's one of the biggest donors to the Republican Party. He has driven the GOP's um, uh, left-wing tendencies. Uh, he, he's, he's been a huge advocate of same-sex marriage. And you know, he, he really supports basically the LGBTs um, or sorry, the, G the GOP's LGBT initiatives. Like the, he's a driving force behind that stuff. Um, and so Elliott Management is his huge head fund. And what, what Paul Singer is infamous for is, is for basically coming into companies that are struggling uh, and then kind of um, changing things up really aggressively and uh, uh, kind of taking them over and then just doing things that are uh, described as, as vulturish. Um, and so he, he did this with Twitter. And so over the last year or two, Elite management has been basically getting more control over, over Twitter uh, by buying up shares, uh, by installing members of the company on, on Twitter's board. And it culminated with uh, Elite management, Singer's Fund, spearheading a push to oust Jack Dorsey which they did so successfully. And the new Twitter CEO, Parag Agrawal, who is, I guess we can just describe him as progressive. He's, he's very left-wing. He, I mean, his public statements are, are not ambiguous. You know, he doesn't believe in, in, in free speech. He thinks that, um, and I mean, you can make an argument that it's a private company, whatever, but we'll get to that in a moment. But if you look at his public statements, you know he, he thinks that basically the, the rules of Twitter should be based on what he calls harm mitigation. Um, and that, well, what is harm mitigation? And he'll say, well, we should look to the definitions that are put forth by credible institutions. So as, a, you know, as someone who's on the political left, who do you think he, he thinks is credible? You know, like the WHO, uh, the CDC. But he actually goes further. Like one of the things I note in my article is that Twitter's rule about uh, va vaccine criticism uh, actually goes further than what the CDC, even what the CDC would recommend. Um, and that rule that prohibits certain types of criticism about vaccines, with it, which they characterize as misinformation, was actually stealthily updated in this last December. Uh, people only noticed it because uh, there, there's, a, there's an online group, I think they're called Reclaim the Net, uh, and, and through the Wayback Machine archives, they looked at the Twitter's uh, guideline page and they noticed that some, uh, there had been an update basically overnight to their rules about, about misinformation. And they had added this, they, they had amended it to say that, you know, if you criticize vaccines in a certain way, uh, you can be punished with up to a permanent ban. And which again, it, it, it even goes further than what the CDC would recommend, which I'm not saying that, you know, I, I'm not saying that I consider the CDC like the last word and, or even credible, but I think it just shows you how zealous uh, these people are. And that matters because he, he is in power and by extension, his, his Twitter censorship regime is installed because Paul Singer put him there. And so right after Par Parag takes over, there are all these purges on Twitter, a bunch of accounts get kicked off, 
well, uh, well, MTG was probably the, uh, the highest profile person who got banned from her personal account was banned. I think her, her professional or her, yeah, her congressional account is still there, but her personal account that she was using a lot more got permanently banned. Uh, but again, all of this stuff goes back to Singer. And uh, there, there was a new rule that was implemented under Parag, which is that it's, it's kind of funny because it, in theory, you would think like, oh, this is gonna hurt the left. But, but this new rule is that you cannot post people's private information. So like screenshots of text messages, photographs, things like that, without the other person's consent. So who does that? Who doxes people? The left, right? The, like the, the left has entire packs that, that do nothing but dox people. And um, so, so naturally some people on the right on Twitter were like, this is fantastic. We're just gonna mass report all these leftists who are in the business of doxing people. And Twitter actually responded to, uh, to what they called organized griefing. And so in other words, Twitter characterized it as a mistake that they had removed, they had suspended left-wing accounts on Twitter uh, that were reported by right-wing accounts for doxing. So Twitter was like, this is actually an abuse of our policy. And uh, so that that's kind of shows you, right? Like which way this is going. And around the same time, a Project Veritas associated Twitter account had published uh, a story with, uh, it detailed the second CNN producer uh, because this followed another story. This was the, this is like the second time in like two weeks that a CNN producer was implicated in like a pedophilia scandal. I don't know how else to describe it, but basically Project Veritas got their hands on these text messages that showed a CNN producer, I think for Jake Tapper's show, that showed uh, he had been um, fantasizing about his fiance's daughter sexually, who's a minor, and that he had request solicited like inappropriate pictures of his, this the source's daughter who is also underage um and the source who i think was like a former lover of his um went to project veritas after she went to law enforcement and was like you know i'm i'm communicating with a guy who's literally fantasizing about two underage girls uh and and like even asking for pictures and stuff um and this Twitter account that was associated with Project Veritas published a story and then it got kicked, it got banned from Twitter. So all, all of this is happening under the Twitter CEO that is only in power because of, of Singer and his his you know his um his response to to the question of are you in charge of policy at all? Do you have a hand in policy at all? Because Singer is notorious for, for trying to be engaged in everything uh, when it comes to a company. And, and his response is, well, no, there's like a firewall between me and, and Twitter and I have nothing to do with policy, but, but that's, that's not true. Personnel is policy. So you know who you select to be the CEO, uh, who you green light to be the CEO of a company is in essence policy. Uh, and, and again, all of this, all of this, and, and the, the takeaway from my article is that this is actually really illustrative of the problem with the GOP. You can vote until you're blue in the face, but the Republican Party cannot be expected to change as long as it is beholden to people like Paul Singer, their donors, in other words. That is why the political infra the, the political infrastructure does not change. The faces might, you might get a new person in there or whatever, but as long as Paul Singer is still the one, guys like Paul Singer are still the ones that are really, you know, pumping blood into the GOP, uh, you're, you're not really going to change anything. I think that this paragraph will give your lecture some arsenal, and I read, just before Singer and Elliott management launch the effort to oust oh, oh, Dorsey, New York University professor and Twitter shareholder Scott Galloway wrote a scathing letter to Omid Kordestani, the company's executive chairman. Galloway, who has called on tech companies to explicitly brand themselves as liberal, demanded Dorsey's replacement and threatened to remove any directors standing in the way. Yeah, yeah, and the point that I was making is that 
even if it's not intentional, although you, you, you can argue that it, that it was whatever, but even, even if we say it was not intentional, nevertheless, Singer's actions overlapped with the interests of the political left in bringing more censorship to Twitter. And another point that I make is that that professor was, by talking about Russian disinformation on Twitter, uh, was appealing to this atmosphere of paranoia to which you could argue Singer contributed because, as I note in my article, Singer allegedly, or I should say, the Washington Free Beacon, which receives significant funding from Paul Singer, originated the salacious Russian dossier um, through a partnership with Fusion GPS. That, that was actually the, the, the starting point for that dossier. Now, Singer and the Free Beacon deny that, that ultimately this kind of their early role in it was significant. Um, uh, who, who knows, you know, but they, they, they basically have argued like that trying to draw too hard of a connection is a stretch, whatever. But nevertheless, that, that happened. Uh, Fusion GPS in a partnership with the Washington Free Beacon, which receives funding from Singer, originated the Russian dossier, which contributed to this atmosphere of, of you know, the, there are Russians under every bed um, trying to hijack our elections. And that is what that professor appeals to. You know, like under Twitter, it's it's just become like a hotbed of, of disinformation and all this stuff. And so S Singer ultimately gave ammunition to these people. A and something that's important to note about Jack Dorsey is that it's not necessarily that he was truly all about free speech and stuff. And because after after he left, people were kind of like writing hagiographies of him and and saying, well, you know, say what you want about Jack Dorsey. He was he was actually for free speech. And that's why Twitter was a little bit better under him. It's like, no, Twitter was was less, um, there was less censorship because Jack Dorsey was basically an absentee CEO. Uh, he has all these different things going on. So he was just kind of, it's like a benign neglect, right? Like dad is just never home to spank the kids. <laughs> that That's basically how Jack Dorsey governed. And that was part of the argument of, uh, for getting rid of him, that he's, well, he's never around. He doesn't really run the company. He's He's always like traveling to like Africa or something and, and like working on other projects. So he shouldn't even be the CEO anyways. And that ironically, that is actually what made Twitter a little bit less terrible was the fact that he was, you know, not micromanaging it. And the evidence gets more explosive. The Financial Times noted that Elliott management had threatened it the board with a proxy contest to replace four Twitter directors as part of its, of its push against Dorsey. By March, Singer oh. and his allies had a beaten concessions out of Twitter. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty funny. If you read that article in Financial Times, they argue, um, it, 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 you'd actually have to read it because I, I don't want to I don't want to butcher it by by giving too too strict of a, of a summary, but basically they argue that uh, the I think that the term they use is aura, or no mystique. That's the term they use. That the mystique of LA management is so powerful that it makes people act in bizarre and unethical way. <laughs> <laughs> like the basically uh, people at Twitter are, were so afraid of Paul Singer's hedge fund uh, that they did things that may have been unethical in response to their, their attempted takeover of the, of the company. It's really interesting when you read about it, like uh, people are terrified of Paul Singer and they're terrified of Elliott management. It, it's really a thing that I discovered by writing this article uh, because a lot, of, a lot of the feedback I got was obviously positive, but also, you know, you gotta be careful if you're gonna take on Paul Singer because because he, I mean, it's true. Like the guy, th there's this story about him, uh, basically beating his money out of I think Argentina, and at one point he like impounded uh, a naval ship from the uh, from from the, the the navy of Argentina uh, in, in order to like force them to to pay up their debt. Uh, really interesting. Um, but bas the point is, is that people are truly afraid of him. So. Uh, so I, I believe that article in the Financial Times where it claims that, you know, like they're going to court and they're saying, well, you know, 
Uh, we were scared of Paul Singer. That's why we did this stuff. Pedro, I have done my research on Paul Singer. I, I like to follow leading American businessmen. I want to be Paul Singer. People should be afraid, very afraid. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, no, yeah. I totally agree. No, I 100%. I mean, um, I recently wrote an article about George Soros in my Substack, and and I and I, I wrote about how his mo is basically using his billions uh, to get what he wants through NGOs. He he just funds all of these different nonprofits, not just nonprofits, but he, he just he funds all of these businesses and NGOs and and just uses his money in that way to to change essentially transform countries. And the problem with George Soros is that we don't have one. <laughs> That's the real problem. But the problem with George Soros and, and Paul Singer is that we don't have like a right-wing equivalent. Of, exactly. We don't. Of, like of them. like the, the, you know, the Koch brothers yeah. are rich and they're a bit more controversial than the, than the typical billionaire on the right. But at the same time, the Koch brothers are no longer on the Maizian right. That there was a follow up between the Colt yeah. brothers and Murray Rothbard. Yeah, well, and also the, I mean, there's there's a lot of overlap between the Koch, Soros, and Singer. Uh, they all basically agree on immigration, for example. I mean, um, actually, I'm not 100% on, on Singer's immigration views, but generally speaking, Koch and Soros essentially agree on immigration. Uh, they just you know disagree on whether how much we should have uh, and whether or not uh, illegal immigration is bad. But on on the point of like immigration is is just like a net positive. Like they agree. Um, obviously, crime as well. Like Coke and Soros crime initiatives are very similar. Uh, the the GOP's embrace of left wing crime initiatives, prison and police reform, a, a lot of this stuff is actually being pushed through through Coke organizations uh and and it actually got pushed into the trump agenda through a coke affiliated group that started with the texas public policy foundation they, they get significant money from the cokes and, and they're plugged into all these different coke organizations and projects and, and personnel which ended up in the white house and now they're running uh trump's america first policy institute uh but a lot of this a lot of the, the gop's left movement on crime and punishment actually goes back to the Cokes. And it's really, really not all that different from the stuff that Soros wants. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there, there really is no, there is no true right wing billionaire. And I think that's why conservatives will fawn over guys like Elon Musk and, <laughs> and, and Peter Thiel. Although ah. I, and you I'm mentioned not being... Peter Thiel. I like Peter Thiel, but let's be realistic. I'd love to have him as a guest on the show. But for someone like Peter Thiel, who is actually a contrarian, I've read his work, and Peter Thiel will speak to people who are even on the far right. But for someone like Peter Thiel, who's so influential, follow the money. He's not giving money to Chronicles. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> what I was going to say. Like, I, I, um, I'm, I don't have anything negative to say about Musk and Thiel. But my point is, is, is that that is why the right, why conservatives basically pine for someone like Musk and Thiel to agree with them because they're, they're, they have, you know, who else, who else can they turn to? Who else is, who, where, where are the other based billionaires? You know, and I think the great hope is that Thiel and Musk will be like radicalized and, and start giving money to you know, to the right people. Uh, I mean, they, they, you could argue that they are because Teal is a, a big backer of, um, of, of the candidacies of J.D. Vance and Blake Masters, who are really popular right now on the, let's call them the populist right. Uh, but, but anyway, what I'm talking about is the, the kind of celebrity, the star power that Musk and Teal have over the right, precisely for the reasons that we're discussing, because there's no one else. You know, the left, ironically, Although they like to role play as if they're revolutionaries and you know, like the, the underdog, they actually have all the billionaires. <laughs> they have all the institutional support and all the money. Uh, it's it's actually us. You know, we're we're the ones that are starved for institutional support and money. No, we're going to talk briefly about American Unity Fund, a GOP nonprofit for LGBT issues. 
Yeah, that's that's a the singer affiliated organization. Um, that's from my article, right? Yes. Okay, yeah, because I you cut out a little bit. Yeah. Um, so this goes back to what I was saying initially about Singer that he has been a driving force for the GOP's embrace of the LGBT agenda, and I think much of it has to do with the fact that one of his sons is gay, which is fine, except you have made your entire <laughs> you've made an entire political program around that right and and what that entails is also demonizing people that are socially conservative within within the gop within with within the right uh people like me are considered you know terrible because we don't think that lgbt advocacy should be a plank in any right-wing movement it's just absurd um and the point that I make in my article is that although people think that there's this real friction between Trump and Singer, I mean, there isn't. There was initially, but obviously that stuff got worked out. And the, the point that I make is that through one of these Singer-funded LGBT groups, the, the seeds of the, the Jenner candidacy in California were sown. And so that was actually the starting point for what became the Jenner for governor uh, candidacy in California, which it, it, that kind of marked a union between Singer world and Trump world uh, in a very public way, because like I said, the origins were, um, were Jenner met Singer people through that Singer fund. And then it seems like that got the wheels turning and then when Jenner decided you know, that to, to launch this campaign, the, the staff, the personnel were drawn entirely from Trump world. Former Trump White House officials and former Trump cam uh, campaign people ended up uh, comprising the Jenner team. So, yeah. Excellent analysis. analysis. I really appreciate your article. But we're going to move on. But before we move on, I must state briefly, immigration is, is associated with economic growth and entrepreneurship. But many of these studies are exploring the exploits of immigrants from European countries and some East Asian countries. I am not against immigration. However, I'm not in favor of open borders. If we accept the purpose or the role of the state, then the state must be allowed to create laws pertaining to immigration. Furthermore, only Western societies are compelled to open their borders. Now I'm saying this to comment on an article you wrote titled, titled Lobbyist Alleges Cato Institute Mer Mercenaries Are Paid to Push Pro-Immigration Studies. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was actually a really I see I use the word fun. I don't I don't know if that's the correct word, but that was uh that that piece actually took some real uh legwork because I had to dig and, and kind of you know connect all these dots. And uh it was definitely a project that I enjoyed. Uh not least of all because I deeply disliked the Cato, Cato Institute. But yeah, that tip came to us from a group that managed to infiltrate, uh, I don't know if, if it's really that hard, but, but uh, th there is apparently a telegram chat that is run by a guy named Aman Kapoor, who is an immigration lobbyist. And in that telegram chat, which is private, uh, there, there are a couple of people on our side who are just kind of monitoring it because Aman Kapoor will just post about, you know, the, the, the latest, news and updates for his uh for his immigration lobbying efforts and we received a screenshot of a message that he subsequently deleted where he talks about he's basically complaining that the cato institute uh that, that a particular scholar at the cato institute had taken money from him and he, he's basically saying you know people think that this person this scholar um is is doing this research out of the kindness of, the, of his heart but you know they don't know that these guys are just he actually it's ironic he describes them as mercenaries it, it, it's a corrupt guy who's complaining about a, another person being more corrupt you know it's like the unethical guy complains about the unethic the, the bad ethics of another unethical person and um 
and yeah, Kapoor is just complaining that that you know he's not doing this out of the kind of of his heart. Uh, we we subsidized his work. We basically helped launch his career by paying him to write this stuff under the table, and and so we we or I I looked into it and I created a kind of timeline that that corresponds with the claims that Amon Kapoor was making about this scholar. His name is David Beer, and. We, I just kind of drew circles around it because a lot of the stuff is really difficult to to nail down, and it's also not even it's it's also not even I don't even think you could say it's illegal. It's just obviously unethical and slimy, because on the surface this is you know an independent research group. They're they're very serious scholars, very prestigious, uh, but at the end of the day they're just mercenaries like Amon Kapoor described them, and the the, the really the jumping off point for that story was the fact that. Um, this had actually happened before in the, I think the early 2000s, where a Cato scholar named Doug Bando had taken money from the infamous lobbyist, Jack Abramoff. He had, he had been taking money under the table. So the money was not reported to the Cato Institute. The, the relationship was, was totally hidden from the Cato Institute. Um, and that's important. I'll get to that in a sec. He had been taking money from Jack Abramoff to write favorable columns about his clients. And so he, he got caught doing this because Abramoff was being investigated and they found these payments and the Cato Institute uh, fired him. He, they either fired him or he resigned, but he was subsequently rehired. And that when I remembered that, that that had happened, I thought like, this is exactly the same scenario because Bando's, Bando's, um, his, his comment to the press was like, well, I, I was writing about things I was already interested in. I was just taking money from, from Abram off while doing it. And, you know, ba basically it was like a little side hustle for him, but the fact that he wasn't disclosing it is what got him in trouble because, you know, it's, again, it's highly unethical. And it was exactly the same thing, uh, that David Beer was allegedly doing. This is what Kapoor claims David Beer was doing. And, uh, the, the money would not be reported to Cato. If, if this is true, you know, Cato would not be aware of the relationship um, because it's, it's all happening under the table. Uh, but the funny thing is, is that Bando is actually, uh, he, he's a, he's a non-interventionist, if I, if I recall correctly. And he had even defended Rhodesia. Uh, he had argued that, that, that Rhodesia, like that Rhodesia should not be subject to uh, sanctions and stuff. And so in a way, I, I almost felt bad using Bando to build my argument because it's like, I, I like him for his foreign policy views far more than I like these immigration mercenaries. But but that that's basically what the article was about in a nutshell. And Cato Institute never responded officially. Uh, I, I did get some mean tweets from Alex Narasta and then some other senior senior guy at Cato who called me an ass and then subsequently deleted the tweet. <laughs> he, he, he called me an ass and said, uh, that we have, you know, strict policies at Cato that prohibit this kind of stuff. Because again, it's, I don't think it's illegal. I think it's just extremely unethical, right? And, and so he had said, like, you know, we have policies to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen. And I, then I was thinking to myself, like, wait, you guys rehired Doug Bando, though. You know, you, uh, so it's like, do, the, do you have policies? But I think that's why he actually deleted it or that or he, because he called me an ass. But anyways, uh, they never responded to it officially. Doug Bando is still uh, an esteemed scholar. I yeah. read Doug Bando, yeah. Doug Bando every now and then. Yeah. And that's for Alex. I read Alex all the time. Some years ago, I actually met him. I went to a, a seminar that was sponsored by the Cato Institute. Mm -hmm. And I've interviewed many people from the Cato Institute. So I don't have anything against Cato. I actually like Cato's publications. Yeah, I, like I said, I, I, I dislike, I mean, Alex is, I try, I try not to swear too much, but I, Alex is just thoroughly unlikable. Uh, and there's a strong, there, there's, um, well, I'm, I'm not going to say too much more than that, but I mean, the guy is just like reprehensible. Uh, but like I said, Bando, I don't, I don't have a problem with Bando. Um, and I like, like I said before, I almost felt bad for, for having to use him to illustrate, like, this is not actually unprecedented. Cato has done this before. Uh, because Bando, I think, actually does good work. He, he's a, he's a non-interventionist on foreign policy. 
But the, the problem with the immigration side of Cato is that not only do they publish these studies that I think are, I mean, I, not that I think that are in fact harmful to American workers, but they're also vicious. Like Beer and Alex will accuse anybody who disagrees with them of being racists, you know, being bigots or being xenophobes. They're disgusting. If they, if they can't, uh, if they, if they can't make a point, they'll just call you a name. And then if you fight back, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll scream bloody murder. Like it's, it's, I have nothing but, uh, nothing nice to say about the immigration people of Cato, uh, unlike Bando. So. All right, then interesting points, but we we have to move on a bit. Douglas Murray, you also, you also have a piece on Douglas Murray. I don't have a, I don't have anything against Douglas Murray, but Pedro, what's the purpose of conservatives like Douglas Murray? Nothing. <laughs> I don't know. No one. Uh, apparently, we need them uh, to win to win something. Although no one, no one can explain to me why we need. Um, did, sorry, did you did you call him a conservative, or did you say why conservatives need him? I I, I called him a conservative. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I don't know because, uh, I mean, D- well, Douglas is a neoconservative in the first case. Like he, he literally wrote a book called Neoconservatism: Why We Need It. Uh, that's actually a a book that he wrote, I think before the strange death of Europe. And he's actually affiliated for, with with the Henry Jackson society, which is this, uh, British neoconservative think tank. Uh, one of the members on the board, uh, one of its directors is, um, he actually worked at Paul Singer's hedge fund. Until 2019, he had worked there for over a decade as a senior portfolio manager. So, I mean, there's a whole like there's a whole connection there uh, with 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 neocon world. Um, But it's funny. I actually have one of I I think I actually have one book from Murray, and it's the Strange Death of Europe. I say I think because I might have another one. I'm not sure, but I, I have the Strange Death of Europe, and you know, I, I had been aware of him, not super, I, I kind of forgotten he existed, frankly. Uh, but I, I was briefly familiar with his work, forgot he existed, and then was reminded of his existence when he attacked me. And, but, but the article that I wrote was not about him, his attack on me. It was, it was about an article that he wrote for Unheard Magazine, which is another British publication. And I, I mean, you have to read what he wrote, I think, to understand why I wrote a polemic in response. I read he, some he, of it. I didn't read all of yeah. it, but I understand the context. Yeah. He, well, it's more for your audience. Basically, he, he writes a piece where he's, he addresses what he claims is a very serious problem. Why won't reasonable liberals like Bill Maher and Barry Weiss ever identify as conservatives, although they feel alienated by their natural friends on the left? And it, all of this was revealed to him when he was invited to the National Conservatism Conference uh, in Florida last year, where all the, it's, it's inc- I'm sorry, it is incredibly pompous. Like, it, it is so arrogant the way that he writes. He's like, well, I attended the conference, although I only agreed with one third of the agenda. And I was asked to be a speaker, but I settled for the position of a panelist instead. It's like, oh, thank you so much for blessing the audience you know, with, with your presence. And, and, you know, as he's sitting there at a conference where he only agrees with some of it, and, and you know, he, he humbly is a panelist there, he's listening to conservative scholar Patrick Deneen talk, and he, this is how he writes, and it was while listening to him that I, I found myself in considerable disagreement with him, and I realized why people like Bill Maher would never in a million years join the conservative movement, and then he writes this, this Jeremiah against people like Patrick Deneen, and the problem in a nutshell, with the right to Douglas Murray, is that it's is that it is not the left. <laughs> it, it cares. It cares too much about religion. It cares too much about traditional patterns of life. It cares too much about basically decency. And and I, this is important. Like one or two paragraphs down, because it's important to note that he uses Deneen, and you know, Deneen is I think Deneen's a good guy. Um, He's, 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 he, I think he's just a decent person, but he uses Deneen as a kind of foil. Deneen is where the article turns. 
and he starts attacking conservatism. And one or two paragraphs after he, he cites the Neen speech is, is like the moment that he had an epiphany. He says that the reason Bill Maher and Barry Weiss would never identify as conservatives is because of who they would have to associate with. And basically, I mean, you can see what he's doing here. The problem with the right is that it's too right wing. It needs to be less right wing in order to court people like Bill Maher and Barry Weiss without whom we can't win. And maybe that means we have to demote guys like Deneen or myself, you know, like, because that's, we're the problem. We're keeping people like Bill Maher from joining our ranks. And, you know, obviously we need Bill Maher to win. It, it's, it, I wrote a response to it because it's, it was Laughable. such a, yeah, no, it's, in, it's so, that, that's, and that's the funny thing. A lot of people, because that came after he attacked me and, and called me an anti-Semite, uh, total nonsense. But that, that article came after that. And I got tons of messages from people saying like, did you know, did, on the one hand, did you see this article? And on the other hand, like it is so badly written and so badly argued. And, and ultimately it boils down to that. The problem with conservatives is that they're conservative. But P Patrick yeah. Dineen is a serious scholar. And if you want yeah. people to respect the conservative movement, well, I don't agree with all of his point, but Patrick Dineen is known for criticizing liberalism and capitalism. Yeah. So it's actually a good collaborator. Yeah. And secondly, yeah, yeah, Bill is an entertainer. I don't care for <laughs> Bill. He's not funny. And Barry, well, Barry is not liked by many. So she's neither here nor there. Yeah, no, it, it, Bill Maher. Um... And I, I, I noted this in my article, Bill Maher has mocked uh, conservatives for their immigration views, characterizing them as bigoted. Like we're, the, the right is bigoted and stupid for wanting to restrict immigration. What about religion? Well, Bill Maher made a whole documentary where, and look, I'm not a particularly religious person. Uh, every now and again, I, I go to mass, but, um, but although I'm not particularly religious, I understand that people need to believe in something, right? And I'm not going to I'm not going to denigrate people's beliefs because they're important. But Bill Maher made an entire documentary where he ridicules people for their beliefs, and in conclusion, he he says that uh, for mankind to live, religion must die. This Laughable. man is totally vile. And Barry Robin, Weiss, let me let me yeah, continue. Yeah, continue. I don't want to cut you, but yeah, no, Bill Bill assumes that he's so smart. But Robin Dunbar, a serious scholar, has many articles explaining why we need religion. Religion associated with pro-sociality, well-being, yes. and even economic growth yes. in some context. So yeah. Bill Bill again is a big whatever. No, it, it's it's not just that you know he disagrees with people's religious beliefs, it's that he has to, he feels the need to mock them and destroy them. And that is who we need to accommodate on the right. It's, again, it's very difficult for me not to, not to swear left and right. Uh, and then Barry Weiss is a hypocrite. You know, she, she complains, and so is Doug, Douglas Murray, like they complain about cancel culture and then they scream murder at anybody to their right, you know, anti-Semite, racist, bigot, whatever, like uh, they're the they're the worst perpetrators of cancel culture. They they just they just target people who are to their right, and they appropriate. You know, like like Weiss is now a truth teller because she went on Bill Maher's show and said, "Well, you know, I'm not really comfortable with vaccines or some shit. I don't, I don't vaccines are mass, but anyways, it's like that that was a moment where people were like, oh no, you know, like uh, or not oh no, but saying like kind of praising her, and it's like, wait, you're praising this woman who punches right for saying the things that conservatives, the right wing has been saying for the last two years, and they have been getting demonized for it and deplatformed and destroyed. You know, it's kind of like, do you not see what, what's happening here? These people are pulling out the rug from beneath you and then trying to claim credit and then canceling people to the right. And anyways, yeah, I mean- Robert Woodbury, you know. he has a study on Protestantism and he also has a different study on religion and it's a relationship to development in Botswana. So people yeah. like Bill assume that they're so smart, and this is why I'm citing the data. The yeah. evidence is not in his favor, not at all. Well, yeah, I mean, you could even, uh, I guess an even older example of this would be uh, Weber's The Protestant yes. ethic, uh, the Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, right? I mean, it makes this argument. Um, it has been criticized, though, but Weber is yeah. not completely wrong because modern studies do show that Protestants ac actually work for longer hours. Yeah, well, I think that's that's the art. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's right. Um, 
You would. Yeah. So the, the point is, is that, that, that Mar is totally wrong about religion, but not just wrong. He's, he's also just like flatly disrespectful. Boorish. He's boorish. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, I mean, uh, Murray's article was very bad. Um, and I, I wrote a polemic about it, which uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed. Although I don't, I don't, I try not to do those too much. I try to focus on actual, actual reporting. So, but uh, it's not, it's not a polemical piece. I don't consider it to be polemical. Yeah, uh, well, I guess good. <laughs> yeah, remember, I I don't. People should not misuse words. I get what you're saying. It's a bit argumentative, but polemical pieces are more emotional than logical. I think that maybe it also comes down to a matter of interpretation. I, mean, I, I don't use polemical uh, in a negative sense at all. Okay. Um, I, 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 I actually, I, I got my start mostly just writing kind of angry commentary, um, but I shifted away from that to focus on something I think the right does not do nearly enough of, which is actual uh, journalism, actual reporting, kind of like stuff that I did with Cato and with the Paul Singer stories. Like I, I, don't, I don't think we have enough of that. Um, and that's obviously very different from simply writing your opinion about something. And do you know what's also lacking on the right? Mm. We don't have enough people anymore writing academic pieces for a public audience that are not related to political events. So remember recently I wrote a piece on polygamy. Many of the mm. pieces that are, po- yeah, you're, yes, you're laughing because that was really for an academic audience. Mine is published today. <laughs> but many of the pieces published today are just political and entertaining. They, they lack a bigger picture. Yeah, that's why I like Chronicles. And that's, and that's why they have been so influential in my thinking and the way I write, because the typical Chronicles piece will usually take something from current events and then place it in the context of a much bigger story. And you know, th- this is what Paul does. Like Paul wrote a piece about dri- driving Miss Daisy, uh, this, this old movie, I think with Morgan Freeman. And uh, I think the, the title is like driving this racial activist. <laughs> and, and so Paul uses, he, I guess he, he watched that movie again, Driving Miss Daisy, and realized that a lot, of, a lot of the narrative in that movie about the relationship between Southern Jews and Blacks is just like not true at all. And so he actually wrote a kind of like a history of Southern Jews and Blacks and stuff uh, in Chronicles recently. But it starts off again with Paul just describing how he was... Um, Find, re-watching this movie after a long time and finding so much wrong with it. And so that, that's, that's a typical Chronicles piece. And it, I was reading it and thinking like, this is, this is very scholarly, and, but at the same time, it's very digestible. Uh, anybody can read this and, and come away enlightened. And I think that's, that is the typical Chronicles piece. And another publication that I think does this- Mother in Age? Uh, I actually, I don't read them uh, very much at all. Um, I should subscribe to them, but uh, I don't have anything bad to say about them. I, I think they- uh, I think they do good stuff, uh, but it's actually tell us is what I was going to say. Okay. Uh, yes, I know it. Yeah. I think they, they do some really interesting stuff. I'm actually, uh, I just cracked open their summer 2021 issue. It's on global perspectives on constitutionalism and populism. It, it's actually quite interesting. And um, it's, it's again, they'll, they'll usually take like current events and then frame them in, in the perspective of these, uh, these, these much bigger questions uh, on, of theory and philosophy. I think it's actually a very good journal. I, I kind of want to submit something to them. You should. Martin Luther King, Pedro, Martin Luther King was a great man. But if you respect a great man, one must engage in the impartial assessment of his legacy, the thwarted legacy of Dr. King. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was uh, another iconoclastic piece that I enjoyed writing. And I think we published it on MLK Day. So basically, in 2019, a MLK historiographer named David Garrow published a story in a British journal called Standpoint. And he basically outlines all this new research about MLK that he claims comes from these never before seen FBI files that a lot of this stuff will be unclassified and made available to the public in 2027. For now, only bits and pieces have come out, but what has come out is, in his, in his mind, damning 
for the legacy of MLK. He, and again, this is someone who won a Pulitzer Prize for writing biographies of MLK. So this is not someone, this is not a right-wing person. He's not me, in other words, he's not me. He's a democratic socialist who, who supports MLK, who, who, like I said, wrote you know, a kind of glowing biography of him and for which he won the Pulitzer Prize. And here he is saying, oh my God, uh, the new evidence casts a tremendous shadow over all this stuff. And if we, you know, if, if this, if half of this is true, it's going to force us to completely reevaluate MLK's legacy because it is just so bad. And, and one of the, one of the things that, that Garo claims to, to have, uh, to have seen with his own eyes is, are these, these accounts of FBI, FBI surveillance efforts on MLK, which is not a secret, uh, but he, he notes this importantly. A lot of this stuff was never supposed to see the light of day. And so the, the surveillance on the one hand and the notes that FBI agents were, were kind of scribbling on the other hand, it, it, they did not do this stuff thinking that, you know, the public is going to know what I'm writing here in the margins. So it's, it's, and his point is like, you cannot easily argue, well, the FBI was just trying to defame him uh, because these agents had no idea of knowing, you know, that this stuff would ever, ever see the light of day. So it, it's interesting because he makes that point like three or four times in this long article, you know, kind of, kind of actually uh, playing devil's advocate for the FBI. And, uh, but it, and, in one instance, uh, a, a parishioner is being raped by a, a minister in front of MLK. It's a female parishioner that the, this minister brought. It was a friend of MLK. I don't remember his name right now off the top of my head, but uh, they, they brought these women to a hotel, introduced MLK to them, and then um, this woman is being raped by the minister and MLK is laughing and offering advice according to these FBI files and, and the notes that Garrow reviewed. And uh, the, like, that's just one example. There's, there's all this other stuff, all these other similar examples of basically MLK being a witness to uh, sexual assault, to rape, uh, and then just kind of either laughing about it or talking about it. There's, there's another example where a woman protests uh, kind of being coerced into having sex with another one of these guys, another one of MLK's friends, and MLK is, uh, starts talking about how she can be kind of disciplined and made to enjoy the sexual acts that she's being asked to do. Uh, asked to do. Uh, and so this came out in 2018, but it was basically forgotten. Not, not forgotten, but it was memory hole for obvious reasons, right? Uh, no one wants to talk about this. And th this should have been an explosive story. Like, you know, Hold this should on. have been everywhere. Hold on, Go Pedro. Ahead. Remember, yeah, yeah. Martin Luther King also impregnated a married woman, according to the FBI report. I have yeah. read the FBI report. It's right in front of me. Yeah. He, and yeah. he participated in orgies, yeah, yeah. according to the report. And then, this is what is really troubling. King's personal conduct with the yeah. funds that he had received from the Ford Foundation, King held the first of two workshop, the first of two workshops in Miami, Florida, in February 1968, to train Negro ministers in urban leadership. However, Pedro, during the training session, people engaged in orgies. Yeah. One Negro yeah. minister in attendance later expressed his disgust with the behind-the-scene drinking, fornication, and homosexuality that went on at the conference. Yeah, no, it's really, really messed up. And my article only scratches the surface. That, that, and that's what I was talking about. And that's what Garrow was talking about. Like, this is, you know, this is just the, the surface of what is to come about. There MLK. is more to come. There is more yeah. to come. Yeah. And I mean, it is just the little bit that has come out and the little bit that I resurfaced in my article uh, is already really horrendous. So yeah, I mean... And so why did I do this? Because MLK is kind of like an important myth for the incumbent political order. And it's an order that I think is rotten and bad and it, it needs to be disrupted. It's an order that basically teaches white people that, that they should be ashamed of themselves, that they're terrible. Uh, it, it seems to provide a lot of justification for things like critical race theory. And I think that 
part of deconstructing that political order and changing it and bringing something new into existence is slaying these sacred cows. And one of them is this legacy of MLK, so. Exactly, and as we both argue, the FBI report is damning. It does not paint MLK in a positive light. It refers to his, to his links with some unsavory political organizations and Stanley Levinson is also yeah. a prominent yeah. person in this report. Yeah, I, I actually want, I I'm, I'm, will probably be doing a follow-up soon based on some new some new documents that some people uh, I'm supposed to see at some point in the near future. Uh, and, and I actually want to focus on the relationship between MLK and, and Levison. Levison was, according to American intelligence, Levison was connected to the Communist Party of the United States. He was some kind of, he handled the money for, for the uh, CCP USA, or no, sorry, the, the, the Communist Party USA. And uh, Levison's relationship with MLK is interesting because they meet and after a short period of time, like right after they meet, Levison gives MLK the equivalent of like over $90,000, I think, in, in current year dollars. It gives him a significant amount of money, like, you know, basically funds him. And, but moreover, I think Garrow actually notes this, that Levison was, was handling all of MLK's finances, like he paid his rent for him. A really interesting relationship between a guy who is supposedly you know, a, a serious player within the Communist Party of the United States and MLK, this major civil rights leader, uh, getting money from him, also you know, having him run his personal finances, like paying his rent and stuff, really, really uh, peculiar relationship. And that's, again, this is something that I think needs to be brought to light. Uh, th this, on the one hand, because it undermines the idea that, you know, there was never any serious communist infiltration of the United States, which is totally untrue. And on the other hand, that, that MLK was some kind of a saint. It's like, no, not only was he an absolute pervert and a degenerate, which he just factual, it's just factually true. I'm sorry. That, that's, those, those words are not hyperbole, that they accurately describe the man and his actions. But on the other hand, that he he was being uh, subsidized by some really bad people. Yes, Levin's a radical businessman who was affiliated to the Communist Party. Remember, Martin Luther King is a great man, or was since he's dead. But many great men are not good men. Yeah, I think that's that's a fair way to put it, right? Uh, I've, I don't know where I've heard that before, but I've heard that saying before. Um, but. Again, the, the problem with MLK is that, uh, I guess the, the morality of the myth of MLK, I, I think is just, it's, it's counterproductive. Uh, it, it seems to, to justify all kinds of bad things that happen today. Yes. You know, well, MLK would want us to pick a Supreme Court justice uh, based on race, you know, or, or MLK wouldn't want us to ban CRT or something like that. Um, it, it's just, uh, and, and I say I say that because again, conservatives like to latch on to the whole you know, judge a person by the content of the character, not the color of their skin. MLK explicitly said, "No, we should actually hire and judge people based on their race." <laughs> on their race, like uh, he he would have been for affirmative action. He would have been for CRT. He would have been for all that stuff. All right. So unfortunately, Pedro, I have to wrap up. So I have, so I have to say bye. But this conversation. That's been awesome. Bye, Pedro. Thank you, Lipton.